we could just end the service right now. I'll be satisfied. Y'all probably won't be. That singing is fantastic. Where's the young man? You did a fine job leading the singing. Thank you. Thank you. Setting the tone. It's kind of bad when you go to hold a gospel meeting somewhere and first song the song leader leads is we're ready to suffer. So at least we didn't start off on that kind of foot. It's so good to see you, literally. Uh, it's good to be here. And uh, I want to thank you all for being patient with me and understanding my situation earlier in the year. And when I say it is good to be able to see you, that's literally true for my situation, those of you who are familiar with it. It's good to see friends, uh, brethren we've known for years, who are here with us, traveled some distance, and thank you for taking time out of your schedule to be here. If you're visiting for the uh, first time, or maybe not, and uh, I think they've got some visitor's cards. If you could fill some of those out and leave them laying in the seats, we'd appreciate the record of your presence with us here this evening. I want to thank the, uh, the elders for being patient and working with me and rescheduling the meeting and uh, giving me time to recover enough to, to be here. Still have a long road to go. I've got, uh, for those who don't know, I had a, my... Uh, had cataract surgery last year, didn't go good, it caused my retina to be detached. And I don't want to scare anybody away from having cataract surgery. What happened to me only happens to about 1% of the patients. Lucky me. And then it became detached again, so I had two surgeries early in the year. I've got another one scheduled for the 26th of this month. And, and uh, so we've, uh, we've got a road to go. But anyway, it's good to be here. It's good to be with you. I hope you have a copy of the book. I'll ask you to follow along with me in the book. I'm going to try to stay on script most of the time while we're here. You can open up to the introductory part of the, the book. <clears throat> and then we'll get into the first lesson. For tomorrow night's lesson, after the lesson part of it, I'm asking the young people if they want to, could come down front or sit in the center or someplace. Uh, I want to talk with you for just a little bit. Uh, it would be a good time if you know young people, preteens, teens, college age folks, and invite them to come to uh, that service and ask them to come down front and sit at the uh, end of the lesson. Let me tell you a little bit about this uh, book and the information that you have in your hands, and I thank the elders for working with me on the publication of, of this. Uh, I used to manage a program called Principal Centered Leadership when I worked for Bridgestone. And the people that are talked about in this book are people that I worked with, people who I know personally. And uh, I've written a book called Developing Principled Leaders and uh, taught classes uh, on that. And I've, I've had brethren who have been critical of the, the, le the lessons because I reference people in the secular world in those lessons just like I do in this, this book. And I understand and I appreciate the criticism that I've received for that. What brothers have told me that I should just stick with Bible characters and uh, not refer to people in the secular world. But let me give you my excuse or reason, and I pray and beg your indulgence for it. I would never seek to replace or substitute the Bible, the people in the Bible, the great characters of faith in the Bible and their stories. Not at all. Not at all. I would never encourage that. What I'm afraid has happened many times in the, some of the discussions over the years in Bible classes and talking about people like Abraham and Moses, apostles, a lot of folks see those stories and almost treat them like they're comic book heroes and not real people. They're real people. They're real people, just like you and I, just like others today. 
And then another thing I saw happening is a lot of people treated the stories and the things that are taught in the Bible as, ah, oh, that's 2,000 years ago. It doesn't have any relevance for us today. And I want to tell you, it's a, the, the stories are very real. The lessons are very real. And they're very relevant today. And that's what these lessons are about. Bible, if you notice the title, it talks about Bible values for living today. Because these people that I'm going to cite, one of them has just recently passed away, are still living. And if I wish you could be, be blessed with the opportunities that I've had to sit, have, sit down discussions with these people. And they will be the first to tell you how real Jesus Christ is in their lives. And how much the Bible and the stories and the things taught in the Bible mean to them in their lives. And these are people who have these days accomplished great things because they had these values, these principles, this faith they had in God and in Jesus Christ as the driving, motivating factor in their lives. We want to bring these things to the modern world and make them live in our hearts and in our lives. So, that's my excuse. And I hope you'll bear with me during these, these lessons and you'll see the intent behind it. Now, having said that, if you would, turn over to page 2. And then open your Bibles with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 14. The first lesson is faith, the road to unafraid. And if you have your Bibles, I'm going to be again reading in Matthew 14, beginning in verse 24. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. In the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. Years ago, when our daughter was graduating from Western Kentucky, we went up for the graduation ceremony. It was right at the same time as Carlin and my anniversary. So she and our daughter Paige went to the mall and they came back, and this was my anniversary present, this book called The Road to Unafraid. So that weekend... While they were running around the mall and doing whatever, I stayed in the hotel room and I read. Because once I started reading this book, I just couldn't put it down. I'm a slow reader. Yes, it took me the whole re weekend to read it, even though it's not a big book. But it's about a man and his story by the name. At the time he wrote the book, he was a captain. At the time I met him, he was a major. Captain Jeff Struker. And I want to talk to you about my friend, and I'm proud to call now Jeff Struker my friend. We were going through some bad times at our company. Work in manufacturing is up and down. Sometimes there's the threats, the layoffs, shutting down the factory. All that was going on. A lot of people were afraid. Every day they came to work, we heard the feedback. They were afraid. Afraid they might lose their jobs, their livelihood. So after I read Jeff's book, I reached out to some folks. I had done a lot of work with folks in the military, made some contacts. Make a long story short, 
I ended up leaving my number, said if you talk to Jeff, have him call me. I only hoped that would be the case. Sure enough, with a couple of hours, I got a phone call. It was Jeff Strucker. I was surprised. So we began a conversation. At that time, Jeff was going in and out of, that's not me, by the way. He's a lot better looking than I am. You didn't have to laugh about that. But he was going in and out of Iraq and Afghanistan, places like that. His main job was to work with young people, 18, 19 year old young people who were in harm's way and trying to counsel them and work with them and help them get over the fear and the things that they had to deal with in their lives and in their jobs. And I thought, you know, if he can do that with those young folks, then he can have something to say to our employees that will be helpful. So we talked about it, and Jeff liked the idea. He was intrigued with the idea. As, as a matter of fact, when we go through this story, he had a personal reason why he wanted to come to our factory. I worked for Bridgestone, and Bridgestone made the run-flat tires. Where's Mike Carrington? I see you remember Mike. And Jeff wanted to come and thank the employees at Bridgestone on the floor of the tour plant and thank them for Bridgestone's run-flat tires because they saved his life and the life of his men who were with him. At least he credited. I think he gave us more credit than we deserved. But here is Jeff's situation. If you've heard of the movie Black Hawk Down or the, the book Black Hawk Down, he is one of the characters that's real life characters that's highlighted in that. In October of 93, he was a part of an elite American troop, special forces group. Jeff was him, himself a top ranger that was assigned to capture the rebel leader of the Somalis in Mogadishu, a man by the name of General Mohammed Far Adi. And what they had planned to do was they would fly in with the helicopters, Black Hawk helicopters. Some troops would rappel down to the ground in a surprise attack, capture a deed and his staff. Jeff was going to lead a convoy of three Humvees. They would drive into the town, take the captured leader, the Somalis, whisk them out before the rebels could be aroused early in the morning. That was the plans. But in the military, nothing ever goes as planned. One of the soldiers who was supposed to repel out of the helicopter fell 70 feet to the ground and was severely injured. So what started off as a mission to capture the leader turned into a rescue mission quickly. And Jeff's job was to go in and pick up the wounded soldier and get him out. In the process of doing that, they aroused the Somali rebels who came out of every building in Somalia and began firing on Jeff and his men in their light Humvees. These were not um, armored Humvees. After the battle, the UN estimated the Somali force to be between 50 and 60,000 armed rebels. That's the gauntlet that they were running. Jeff and his 13 men who were with him and three light Humvees. 14 against 50 to 60,000. The Somalis started shooting at them from every rooftop, out of every window, every corner. It was a bad situation. In the process, his top gunner, Dominic Pillow, was killed. But they made it out. And they made it back to the base. 
And they were all breathing a sigh of relief. Jeff's commanding officer came up to him and said, Sergeant, get your men back together. You've got to go back into the city. A Black Hawk helicopter from which the movie title and the book title came from, Black Hawk Down, has gone down and you need to go in and rescue the crew. And Jeff is trying to process this command. At the same time, their head medical person walked up to him and said, Sergeant, you need to clean the blood and all out of the back of that Humvee because if your men go into battle, they'll be psychologically irre irreversibly damaged. So all Jeff is trying to process all of this information. He drives the Humvee around back. They didn't have any running water. They had a tank and he could dip a bucket out. He was in the process of cleaning the blood and, and the brain matter because Dominic Pillow had been shot in the head out of the back of this Humvee. I talked to Jeff one time. And he said, Keith, when, Jeff, when Dominic got shot, the other two men in the back started screaming their heads off. And he said, I didn't know what was going around. He said, they were screaming, pillow's been hit, pillow's been hit. And he said, when I turned around and looked, he said, it looked like they took a bucket of red paint and threw it all up in the side of the Humvee. So he's round back with a bucket. And he's trying to clean all of this out. And he's covered in the water. He's soaked in the blood. His pants soaked in the blood of Dominic Pillow. And he's looking down, and he panics. He becomes absolutely terrified. Because in two weeks, he was scheduled to go home and be with his wife, who was pregnant with their first child. And he thought, I'll never get to see my wife again. This is a suicide mission. I'll, def I'll be killed. I'll never see my wife again. And I'll never see our first child. And all of my men, I'm leading my men on a suicide mission. And so all of this is going through Jeff's mind. And he's having a panic attack. He's terrified. But then he said, Suddenly a calm came over me. Because I realized that one of two things were going to happen. We would go on a mission and we'd be successful. And in a couple of weeks I'd get to go and be home with my wife. Or I'd be killed and I'd go and I'd be home with the Lord. They went on a mission. In spite of the fear, in spite of the terror, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I want to talk with you this evening about fear and faith being giving us the courage to the road of unafraid. I'll come back to Jeff before we get through with our lesson. What is fear? A lot of synonyms for it. A lot of fascination with it. Haunted houses, horror movies. People seem to be fascinated with it. Fear is talked a lot about in the Bible. There's a lot of actual words in the original language that are translated with the word fear. <clears throat> in the English... The online dictionary says fear is a distressing emotion aroused by impending danger, evil, or pain, whether the threat is real or imagined. 
That's important. It's the feeling underlying that. Feeling. The feeling or condition of being afraid. We'll come back to that definition later in the lesson. Why is it important for us as Christians to be talking about this subject? Well, the Bible spends a lot of time talking about it. And the Bible tells us that fear is one of the main weapons of our enemy, Satan. In the book of Hebrews in chapter 2 and verses 14 and 15, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he himself partook of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. We need to know our enemy. We need to be aware of his weapons and his tactics. If we're going to defeat him, we need to know him. and What he does and how he does the things that he does. And so fear is one of the main weapons of our enemy. Now, it has a lot of sources. Crime, the evil we see in the world, losing your job or income, failure, injury, sickness, loss of health, loss of life, loneliness, abandonment, loss of loved ones, persecution, etc., etc. There are many sources or avenues through which the tempter tries to overcome us with a spirit of fear. But we have help. We have help in dealing with them. There's many things that we see in this world that for many people who are not Christians and do not have this help, they live without hope. And that's such a sad thing. Persecution can come from our fellow man. Jesus said, fear not them in the book of Matthew, chapter 10, verses 26 and 28. The fear of men has been what has caused some to not become disciples of our Lord. John 7 and verse 13, Howbeit no man spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews. Want, nature. I didn't know how, how, how bad the storms might get this evening. They were, they were talking about it maybe being pretty bad. I prayed that it wouldn't happen. I know some people that when a storm starts blowing up, they get scared to death. Some because of maybe they lived through a tornado or something like that, had a bad experience. And that's, that, that fear is very real in their lives. It's very real. Uncertainty. The Bible tells us our life is a vapor. We don't know from one morning to the next. Fear of failure. And fear of death. The encouragement to be faithful unto death means up unto the point that you may die for your faith or because of your faith in the Lord in Revelation chapter 2 and in verse 10. So I've preached before on fear. That whole sermon is just on the subject of what the Bible has to say about fear. There are things that the Bible is very positive about that we are to fear. We're to fear God. 1 Peter 2 and verse 12. Matthew 10 verse 28. Jesus is talking. Jesus is talking. Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. Fear of judgment, missing heaven, not handling God's word right. 
fear the government, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I've talked about this. And I've had people come up to me after a sermon saying, Brother Keith, you know the Bible says over in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 18, perfect love casts out fear. So if you really love God, you won't fear Him. Jesus said, be anxious for nothing. I have a problem when people start taking one verse in the Bible and pitting it against another verse in the Bible. I do. It just bothers me to no end. Because the Bible does not contradict Himself. The God does not contradict Himself. That was Jesus talking in Matthew chapter 10 when he said, fear him. So when you say, we're not supposed to have any fear because perfect love cast out fear, you're contradicting a very plain statement by Jesus. So how do we reconcile these apparent contradictions or conflicting language. Well, let me tell you what I've come up with. And if you disagree with it, and you want to talk with me about it later on, that'll be, be fine. Like Donnie said, I'll be willing to hang around after the lesson tonight and talk with anyone and answer questions. I want you to turn with me to the book of Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 28. Wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. I like that. I think that helps me to understand. There's a kind of fear that's godly. Which means there's a kind of fear that's not. Or there's a kind of fear that's ungodly. I think that's what John said or had in mind when he said, perfect love cast out fear. That ungodly fear, but not the godly fear. And we see that adjective used in other places. The Bible talks about godly sorrow. There's a godly sorrow. There's an ungodly sorrow. You know, sorry you got caught. Not really sorry that you did something wrong. You're really going to repent of it. There's godly sorrow. Paul talked about having a godly jealousy. These are all in your book, by the way. Um, I won't cover everything that's in the books. So you can go back and look at them later on in your private studies. And share it with others. Please feel free to do so. Copy anything into it, by the way. That's in the book and pan it out if you want to. Free to do that. I don't, I don't copyright it. In spite of what Donnie says, I'm not charging for my autograph either. He gets all the proceeds whenever it happens. There's a godly jealousy. Or if there's godly jealousy, there's ungodly jealousy. So that helps me. That adjective, godly, helps me, I think, understand the difference between the kind of fear that Jesus says that we are to have versus the kind of fear that John says perfect love casts out, the godly versus the ungodly. Now, I want to look at the example of our Lord. If you've got your Bibles, Hebrews chapter 5. Now, there's, there's re- very real reasons why I'm laboring with this point. And I'll tell you about it here in just a moment. Because of some things I saw in my studies and preparing and putting together this lesson. Things even my own brethren wrote and said about this subject. I'll talk about that here in just a moment. But I want you to look with me in Hebrews chapter 5 and in verse 7. Now, this is the King James Version. I understand that. 
who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. That's Jesus. Now, here's something interesting. Modern translations and some of the discussions that have gone been batted back and forth between the, the scholars and all doing the translations, they don't like that. That's, in, that how, that's how that's translated in the King James Version. They don't like that word translated fear because that has Jesus being afraid. And they don't like the idea, these scholars, of Jesus being afraid, having fear. And I understand what the scholars have done. And some of you may have some of these more modern translations. The English Standard Version and the Holman Comprehensive Bible Version translate the word fear there as reverence. The New American Standard Bible translates it devout behavior. The New International Version translates it reverent submission. Whereas the New King James Version, the King James Revised Version, American Standard Version translates it godly fear. Strike King James. They strike it. They translate it as godly fear. King James says fear. So they argue, the scholars argue, over whether that word should be translated fear. Because, like I said, these scholars, when you read some of their comments, etc., 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 they cannot comprehend the idea or the concept that Jesus, the Son of God, God incarnate, could experience fear. Brethren, let me say this. How could we argue with others that Jesus was holy man if he did not experience all the things that man experiences? And, and how, how could we? We couldn't. He experienced everything that you and I experience. And fear was one of those things. Now, the writer in the book of Hebrews is referencing the event that happened to our Lord in the Garden of Gethsemane. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Luke chapter 22. And let's look at what the writer in Hebrews was referencing. Luke chapter 22. And I want to look I'm not going to look at the whole text. If you want to look at the whole text, it begins in verse 42 and goes through verse 45. I just want to look at verse 44 with you. Luke 22 and verse 44. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat were, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. You know something? The scholars don't disagree over the wording that's in that text. It says Jesus was in agony. That's the King James Version. Vine says it was used among the Greeks as an alternative to agon, a place of assembly, then for the contest of games which took place there, and then to denote intense emotion. It was more frequently used eventually in this last respect to denote severe emotional strain and anguish. Strong's defines it as dread and fear. So, we can shove aside the opinions of the scholars because when we look at the text, we look at the reference, our Lord experienced agony, meaning fear, meaning dread. Look at the example of the Apostle Paul. Be anxious for nothing, remember? Putting one verse against another. I think Paul's a pretty good example to follow. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 5. 
For when we were come to Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings, within were fears. Still in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 8. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. This is the point. He had fear, but not to the point of despair. That's the point. So it appears from these passages of scriptures and the Bible examples that there is a kind of fear or anxiety that we are warned against, that which is ungodly. At the same time, there is a kind of fear or anxiety that is appropriate. Therefore, it is not a matter of a choice between love or fear. The two are not diametrically opposed to each other. There is a kind which is godly, appropriate, and acceptable, and that which is ungodly, not appropriate or acceptable. I want to go back to our definition of fear. When we talk about fear and feelings, a distressing emotion aroused by impending danger, evil, pain, etc., whether the threat is real or imagined, the feeling or condition of being afraid. This is the point. Fear is a feeling. It's an emotional response to a real or perceived circumstance. It is a very real emotion, even though the source may not be. Now, I'm not a psychologist. I'm not Dr. Phil preaching a lesson from Dr. Phil's book. I'm trying to preach a lesson from the great physician's book. But what do we do whenever we experience any feelings in a negative way? This is something I used to explain to our employees. We'd have meetings. And, What's going on? We're afraid. Okay. Fears of, what are you afraid of? Well, I'm afraid we're going to close the plant down. I'm afraid we're going to get laid off. I'm afraid we're going to do this. Okay. Well, your fear is a feeling. It's a feeling. I said, if you feel cold, what do you do? Well, I'll put on a jacket. Okay. Turn up the thermostat. Okay. If you're outside and you feel cold, you go inside. Okay. These are all things you can do. Change the environment. Change from one place to another. Put something on that acts as a, a buffer to keep you from having that, that feeling. I said it's the same with fear. Absolutely the same with fear or any other emotions that you may have. And then when it gets run down right to it, you can't do those other interventions. You have to tough it out. Getting that in our minds is a hard thing to grasp and to do, especially when we're the ones dealing with it. But enough about that. Because I want to talk about faith being the road to unafraid. I did a lot of research and I'm on page five, by the way, in the books, if you're following along. I, lock, I watched a, a bunch of videos and read a bunch of materials by what I call these, these self-help priests and gurus that are, that are out there. You, you probably have seen Joyce Meyer on TV. I'm not a fan. She has uh, what she calls her faith boot camp in which she suggest that fear is the opposite of faith. And then another one that was real popular at the, at the time when I was doing some of this study, and the person, I had a person who was a friend of mine recommend me watch this guy's videos, a guy by the name of Rick Warren, which has his Saddleback ministry. And in his stuff, he talks about replacing fear with faith. I think he's wrong. And then Max Lakata. There are a lot of people that I worked with who were members of the Church of Christ, and they would tell, oh, Keith, you've got to read Max Lakata's book. You've got to read Max Lakata's book. Donnie, if you had that. Max Lakata preached for a Church of Christ down in San Antonio. It's not a Church of Christ anymore. 
they've gone off into the Calvinist doctrine. But anyway, he had a book that they were real popular uh, about dealing with. Be, it was called Be Anxious for Nothing. And I've put the table of contents in your book just for, for reference. But I'm studying and I'm looking at all this material. And there was this one author who said explicitly, it is a sin to worry. And I thought, well, that's just great. Now some have compounded the problem by adding a guilt trip on top of the things that people were already anxious or in fear about. Now there's some good information out there. If you're of a mind to waste your time looking for it. But basically they all boil down to the same concept. And that same concept is to replace fear with faith. And I believe they're wrong. I believe they're all wrong. Because here's what's going on. I mean, we could talk about all the things the Bible says we're to do, believe in, the care of the Lord, be anxious for nothing, cast your care upon Him, He'll never leave you and forsake you, etc., etc., etc. And they're all great principles. But if we treat these principles the same way we treat the medicine bottle in the cabinet, when we have a headache, we've missed the mark. And that's the problem in our society today. When a problem happens, somebody wants to go to the medicine cabinet, open a bottle and take a pill and takes care of their problem. And people do that with everything, including fear and anxiety. And including using the Bible and things in the Bible and the things of God like it's a bottle of pills. When you have the headache, you go take it out of the cabinet. And that's the problem. Because when you study the Bible and you study about these people that we read about in our Bibles, one of the things we learn is that faith was a way of living. Each and every day of their lives. Not just when they had problems. Prayer was an important part of their daily lives. Not just when they had problems. Are you with me? Somebody nod their head. Throw a book at me. Do something. I haven't put you to sleep yet, I hope. I don't blame you. It's got to be part of our daily lives. When things are good, we have our faith in God and active prayer life. So that when bad times come, and they will come, We're steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. You can't take fear and replace it with faith. That's the point. We need to grow in our faith and in our relationship with the Lord to exercise ourselves unto righteousness Hebrews 5 14 12 11 our senses exercised we need to take courage in our relationship with our brethren like Paul he was on his way to Rome and to his eventual execution and when he saw the brethren in Acts 28 in verse 15 it says that he took courage his brethren gave him Courage. That's a part of our active life as Christians. An active prayer life, an active life of faith is also an active life of worshiping with our brethren regularly. They give us strength. They give us courage. And let us not forget the ultimate source 
of power is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1, verse 19. What is the exceeding greatness of this power to us who believe according to the working of His mighty power? Now, I want to come back to my friend Jeff Strucker because we kind of left him hanging out there. He went on a mission. They did complete it. And after he did, there were officers and enlisted men who came up to him and asked him how it was that in the heat of the battle when they were under fire that he was able to remain so calm. Others were screaming in panic over the radio, but Jeff's voice was calm and reassuring, and they wanted to know why. He told them it was because of his faith in Jesus Christ. Just before they were getting ready to go back out into the field and on a mission, an incident occurred. And it's very significant. I want to share it with you. One of his men came up to him and said something that Jeff said no soldier should ever say to another. He said, Sarge, I cannot go with you. My wife had our first baby, and I'm not seeing it. I'm scheduled to go home in two days. Imagine that. He's being asked to go on a suicide mission, and in two days, this young man, 19 years old at the time, his wife had had their first baby. He's going to get to go home in two days. Jeff told him he understood and he could stay behind, but he needed every man he could get for that mission. He assured the soldier that no one would blame him and nothing would be done. Now I want you to listen real close to this because this is key. Jeff said to this young soldier, the difference between the hero and the coward is not fear. It's what you do when you are afraid that makes the difference. Faith gives one the courage to face their fears. They don't replace their fears. It did not take away Jeff's fear of dying, his concern for his wife and unborn child, or his fear that he was possibly leading his men to their uncertain deaths on what was considered a suicide mission. What faith did for him, though, was give him the courage to put aside his faith, fear, excuse me, to do the job that was in front of him. Now, before I close, I've got to talk about this young man. I had some uh, private conversations with Jeff about this young man. I was fascinated by this. After Jeff said this to this young soldier, he went and he got into the front Humvee, the front of the convoy, and he closed the door and he looked back in his rear view mirror to see what the young man was going to do. And they, showed, they depict this in the movie. And he says, I'm watching in the rear view mirror and I watch this young man do what I believe was the bravest thing I've ever seen a man in a combat situation do. He says, as I'm watching... The young man is standing there with his head bowed and his eyes closed. I think you and I know what he was doing in that moment. He said after about a minute, he opened his eyes, reached over, picked up his flat jacket and put it on, took his helmet, put it on, picked up his weapon and climbed into the last Humvee as it was rolling out of the of the base. Now folks, we denigrate young people. And there are some young people that rightfully need to be criticized because of the hate that they have in their hearts for this country and for a lot of good things. But there are a lot of young men like this man right here. 
and let us not forget him. Away from everything they love. Away from their homes. The cold and the damp and the darkness and the dreariness of night. The loneliness of it all. They pick up a weapon, they stand their post, and they face our enemies, and they say, not on my watch. And God bless them. God bless them for doing it. Let us never forget it. And each night, you and I sleep under the cover of protection that they provide for us. There are many things in life which are a source of fear and anxiety. The struggle some have mentally and emotionally is real. One of the challenges we all face is not to give in and give over to anxiety. People of Israel had returned to their homeland and were trying to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. When they were confronted by a superior enemy, Nehemiah set the various families into places where there were holes and gaps in the city walls. These people had been in captivity for many years. They were not soldiers. They were not warriors. No experience in combat. They were merchants, carpenters, metalsmiths. They were just normal working people. As Nehemiah surveyed the situation, he could see the fear they had. And with these words, he encouraged and emboldened them as I do you. Be not ye afraid of them. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible, and fight for your brethren, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your houses. I borrowed that from Jeff. That's his slide he made up. When Jesus walks with you on the battlefield and you have nothing to fear. There he is, my good friend. May God bless you with the strength, the courage, and the peace as you face and fight the challenges you have in life. May faith truly be the road to unafraid. This evening, if there's anyone here who's not a Christian, Jesus is not a part of your life, we want that to be the case for you. If you're willing to repent of your sins and be baptized, and we can assist you in doing that, I want you to come to the front. Have a seat and let your request be made known as we stand and sing these words of encouragement.